Maximize Your Influence is your podcast for the latest persuasion, sales, and negotiation techniques. Our mission is to help you influence on command, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Your host is the author of Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma, and the best-selling book, Maximum Influence. Now, your host, Kurt Mortensen. All right, let's get rolling to maximize your influence. Welcome, everyone. Kurt Mortensen here. This is podcast getting there. 392, where we get to the missing ingredient. That secret sauce, that tool you need to add to your persuasion toolbox that is now more important than ever. In the past, it was relevant, but now it's top of the list important that most people don't even think about. We're going to talk about that. But before we do, hope everyone's having a good week. Get excited to get back to do some live face-to-face trainings. Those are starting to pick up. Just finished a four-day Zoom call on advanced leadership and persuasion skills. I'm a little hoarse now, you know why. But finished it off, wanted to get this podcast out the door for you. Do appreciate your emails. Of course, you can email me at Kurt, K-U-R-T, at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. Your feedback, your success stories. And yes, I'm doing the final touches on the perfect persuasive presentation training program. I will keep you posted. In fact, if you want a sneak peek and be a beta tester, let me know. Send me an email. I'll be happy to help you out. Let's dive into it. Let's jump into the persuasion this week, Ninja. Go. This one goes to an online video platform. I can't quite remember exactly who it was. It comes through my cable service, and sometimes they have these movies. You think they're free but then they insert a commercial. And you can tell the computer's doing it because they do insert them in strange places. And it, sometimes it's abrupt, it's weird, it's strange, it throws you off. But this service has changed it up a bit, and I'm going to call it a ninja. And it's still annoying to have a commercial in the middle of a movie, but still, this is a little bit better. They changed it up so you're not quite upset, it's not so abrupt, and you're prepared for it. It says at the bottom of the screen, break. And then it said five, four, three, two, one. There was a countdown in seconds to let you know there was going to be a break. That is always much better if you want people to stick around to prepare them for them. And then it had your video resume and it had the seconds and there was a clock there. So you knew exactly how long you had before it would restart. Now, a blunder would be if they said 10 minutes, we'd probably leave, do something else or turn it off. But it wasn't that long. It was worth the wait. It was a decent movie. The ninja being, when you prepare the mind for things like that, it's more likely to stick around. It's more likely to accept it. Now, if you're trying to get instant compliance, sometimes surprising people, you can get instant compliant. Now, when you surprise somebody, you can get instant compliant right then and there, but they regret it, they resent it. Like people that were asked for their seat on a subway, when they were prepared, they could see the person going down the road. When they could see the person going down the row, but when they were surprised, they were more likely to give up their seat. But of course, they resent it like, wait a minute, I shouldn't have done that. So there's kind of a balance there. Even with my daughter, when she was growing up, she was watching TV, doing something else. When she was surprised, it just didn't sit well. It didn't like it. She would actually throw a little tantrum. But I say, all right, we got to turn it off in 10 minutes. Okay, in eight minutes, we're going to turn it off six minutes. And there was a little countdown there. Or would actually put up a clock sometimes where she could see it counting down. And the alarm would go off when it was done. We could turn it off. She was prepared for it. Mentally, some brains do better with the preparation than they do the surprise. So that's what I'm giving the ninja to. and something you could apply. There are some situations where surprise can help out. But most of the time, being prepared, knowing what's coming up, getting the brain ready to roll can be more persuasive than quick, easy, and fast. Just saying. Just put it out there. Something to think about. Which brings us to our reader email. Oh, boy. Now, I'm changing the order a little bit because this email gets us into the geeky, scarly article of the week and into our content, that missing secret ingredient. Alfredo. Alfredo, although you didn't tell us where you're from. If I remember right, if you're Alfredo, I'm thinking about it's probably Canada. Let me know on that one. He says, Kurt, I love the podcast. I'm telling my family, friends, and enemies. Thank you, Alfredo. 
And I'm writing you for two reasons. One, because of greed, and the other, because I need some help. <laughs> okay, Alfredo. Greed, because I want the free gold version of Influence University. Alfredo, it's yours. Of course, when we read your email on the show, you get the free version of Influence University. There's also a free area if you want to check it out at influenceuniversity.com. He said, in a past episode, you mentioned imposter syndrome. I'm interested in more information about that because my boss has it bad. Can you review imposter syndrome and give me some solutions to deal with my boss who is highly infected? Okay, Alfredo, I can do that. So let me back up a little bit and talk about imposter syndrome. Now, if you want the full episode on imposter syndrome, that was episode 333 where I took a deep dive. I'm just going to touch on it briefly today and move on to a few other principles. And you can find the archives at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. You can also find coaching information, the latest products and services. Take your free Persuasion IQ assessment and get a gift. And I'm telling you, you will love this Persuasion gift. And of course, information on Influence University. So bottom line, Alfredo and listeners, imposter syndrome is when people feel inadequate despite of their success, despite of their promotion, despite of their victories. They suffer from self-doubt, and it doesn't matter what proof you give them, they have imposter syndrome. So I'm going to go to the Geeky Scarly article. This was found in Harvard Business Review and Gil Corkendale. I'll put the link at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. We visited this one before, but let's talk about it a little bit for the listeners and for Alfredo. This is real. In fact, another study I was looking at said 75% of people in business, management they were looking at, suffer from imposter syndrome, both male and female. Now, females were more likely to admit it, but males, when it was confidential, tended to admit that maybe they didn't feel like they deserved the promotion, that they were in the wrong spot, that other people were smarter than them that all they could remember were their failures instead of their victories, that they shouldn't be there, that they're going to be exposed, that's imposter syndrome. That feeling of inadequacy, that's there no matter what victories or successes you have. That self-doubt that you have. It's real, it's there. It's a function of low self-esteem, and it's a function of a bad belief system. Now, some researchers say it comes from growing up, maybe labels that are attached to us from teachers, parents, friends, or family, that gets us into the spot that nothing is ever good enough. And some common thoughts, maybe you have this, or feelings you might have that are associated with imposter syndrome, I must not fail. There can't be any failure at all because you'll be found out. Oh, I feel like a fake. You're going to be discovered or found out that you're really not all that. That the promotion was a mistake. Somebody else is better than you. Oh, it was all luck. That's why you get promoted. That's why you're the manager. That's why you're there. Well, that success is no big deal. It just happened. Other people did it. Those are all indicators that you might have imposter syndrome. So if you have a manager that has this imposter syndrome, realize where it's coming from, esteem, beliefs, and how do you persuade them? Because this type of individual that has imposter syndrome, and maybe you see it in yourself, they're afraid to move forward, afraid to make decisions, afraid to fail. They're consistently blaming or not even moving forward because they're going to be found out. And it's very difficult to persuade because they're stuck, they're frozen, they don't want to move forward because they don't want to be exposed. So what can you do in this situation? Now, Fredo, this is what I recommend. You need to let them know that you're on their team. You're there to make them look good, to help them with their victories, to help move them forward. You've got their back no matter what. They need to sense that and feel that. And that might take a little time, but they need to know that. And you can even tell them that. Now, this individual needs time to make a decision. They don't make quick decisions. And you can help them with that decision by using social validation, one of the 12 laws of persuasion and maximum influence. Other people that have done it, that it has a high success rate, that you need to move forward. Also, another thing you can do is make the fear of not making a decision bigger than making a decision. So they're going to look worse if they don't make a decision than if they do make a decision. Not your best tool a lot of times, but can be very helpful as one of your tools. One big thing you can do is offer a promise, a personal guarantee. Look, if it doesn't work out, I will take the blame. I'll take ownership. It'll be my fault. Now, you don't always want to do that, but if you want to move forward, you know it's going to work out. You want to get things moving. Say that. You'll take the blame, 
and it's much easier for them to move forward. It's a real thing, imposter syndrome. Check out the full episode on Podcast 333 if you want more information on that. But Alfredo, that's a big part of it. And a piece of what we'll be talking about today. What is that missing tool? What is that tool you haven't used in a while? What are the tool that 20 years ago is not as important today? It is authenticity. Being genuine, being real, being sincere, you have to radiate it. Especially as you get younger in the workplace, authenticity is a key factor to trust, to persuasion, to influence, and leadership. You have to be authentic, real, genuine, and sincere. You have to radiate that to the rising generation. They need it. Authenticity is the one of the most important things to them. Not a scripted presentation, not reading off a PowerPoint. Think about some of the influencers on YouTube. They just wing it. They go through it. They're real. They're authentic. They talk about their mistakes. They talk about their depression. They talk about their biggest blunders. That's real. That's authentic. That's why when we talk about trust, that when you can reveal a weakness, it actually increases trust because you're real. Because if you're too good to be true, it sounds too good to be true. It, even if it is true, it's not true to them. In fact, it's interesting as the word sincere comes up, let me back up and talk about what that word really means. When you look at that word in Latin, it actually means without wax. You're like, what does that mean, without wax? Because back then when you were making a sculpture or a pillar out of marble, you were sculpting it. If you made a mistake or there was a flaw in the marble, you filled it with wax to hide the deception. But when you put it out in the sun, the sun melted the wax and it revealed that deception. So when you are sincere, you're without wax. This is who you are. People appreciate it because we all have weaknesses. So when you hide those weaknesses and you won't take ownership, you're blaming other people, that's not authentic. And now more than ever, more than any time in history, being authentic is one of the most important things that you can do. Not only talking about the strengths about your product, but maybe some of the weaknesses. Maybe covering some of the strengths of your competitor can make you more authentic. You're also more authentic when you're talking about both sides of the issues. You're educated, you're authentic, you understand both sides. That's why it's really interesting when I do seminars on the persuasive presentation, we do more with impromptu, thinking on your feet, being more real and genuine versus being scripted. One thing that drives me nuts, especially with public speaking, is people that memorize their presentation word for word. Very few people can pull that off. It's scripted. It's not real. It's not genuine. It's not authentic. Someone else probably wrote it, uh, politics, and it doesn't come across very well. Now, a couple things to be more authentic, more genuine, more real. A couple I've already talked about. Getting past the imposter syndrome, taking ownership, being more open about your weaknesses and how you feel. Talked about not to blame, to take ownership of what you've done, some of your past failures. Be less scriptive and more trusting your brain to think on the spot. Again, we've talked about this. You can trust your brain to do that. And let me add a few more. And the big one's your passion. Be a product of the product. So if it's a product that you're persuading people to get, you're using it, you're doing it, you know about it. If it's a service, you're using the service. If you're asking someone to do something you're also doing it. You're part of it. You're a product of the product. You're doing what you're asking them to do. That's how you become genuine. There's nothing more unauthentic than asking someone to do something, trying to persuade someone to do something that you're not doing yourself. That's a disconnect, and that can pull from your authenticity. Another one that's very helpful, and this is also an aspect of trust, is your congruence. When your words don't match your actions, your last message doesn't match this current message, there's a disconnect there. Even the wrong cues or gestures while you're speaking, you're talking, you come across as less congruent. When you can't maintain eye contact, you're standing too far from the person. Maybe you're leaning way back in your chair. Those are also disconnects. So when you're congruent with your message and your gestures, it does increase your believability. You are more congruent. And remember, congruence is a gut feeling, that subconscious trigger. I believe them, I don't believe them. I trust them, I don't trust them. They're real, they're not real. That is the key because the opposite of congruence is basically deception, where you're faking your message, you're faking your body language, or there's a disconnect between what you say and what you do. For example, let me just give you an example here. If I say, man, that makes me angry, and three seconds later I pound my hand on the desk, 
Okay, no, those things happen together that could lack the congruence. Another one as we take a brief view of authenticity is your self-discipline, is your willpower. And I've talked about this one at length, that genuine, authentic leaders have a physical, mental toughness. We also see this with athletes and artists and scholars that can stick to something. And what we've noticed that this self-discipline is an inner strength. People realize that discipline is a choice, and they realize that self-discipline is basically a battery, meaning it's not always fully charged. So what I'm getting at here is that if you can't keep promises to yourself, people see this, and it hurts their perception of you, that you're not authentic, that you're not congruent, because you say you're going to do it, but you don't, because you lack the self-discipline. See, people don't realize that if they have a goal to eat healthy, that when you wake up, your self-discipline, your willpower battery is fully charged. And you can say no. So if you want to eat healthy, you say no to the bagels, no to the donuts, no to the coffee, whatever it is. But every time you say no, it drains your willpower battery. And you get to the point in the afternoon where nobody cares, nobody loves you, and you come home and eat the whole thing of ice cream because you let your willpower battery drain. Pessimistic people, negative thoughts, failure, low blood sugar, lack of sleep, and even stress can drain that battery. So the difference between success and failure is realizing that your battery's drained. And that's okay. It happens to everyone. You just have to recharge it. Be aware and recharge it. How? Well, everyone's different here. Is it watching something funny, talking to someone optimistic, looking at your vision board, exercising, meditation, prayer, walking in the sun, getting some fresh air, taking a nap, whatever it is, you can do this. So be more aware or break down your goals into smaller manageable pieces. Monitoring your progress, reminding yourself of victories, or all of the above. Bottom line, have a game plan to notice when your willpower battery is low and having a game plan to recharge it. Another piece that can really help with authenticity, a lot of people don't think about, and this came up with my research on laws of charisma, is courage. Stand up and be counted. The ability to have those conversations. To stand up for what you believe, what you are passionate about, having the courage even though it might not be popular, even though it might hurt someone's feelings, when you have that heart, that bravery, that spirit to correct someone, to admit that you're wrong, that you were a failure, that it didn't quite work out, that is key. People appreciate that. When you're hemming and hawing, blaming others, not taking ownership, too timid to stand up for what you believe in, that definitely hurts authenticity and being genuine. So be courageous and do the right thing. No one it's time to correct somebody. People appreciate that. When you have the courage, you have the passion, you're a product of the product, that is very important. When you shy away and you're timid and you won't stand up for what you believe or you just follow the crowd because that's what the loud voices tell you what to do, that can hurt your authenticity. So authenticity is real. Even in your surroundings, the pictures on the wall, The way you shake hands, how close you stand to somebody, your percent of eye contact, they all come together to trigger that authenticity. So with me, this is real. Again, especially get younger in the workforce, being authentic, being genuine, being real, being you, being a product of the product, so important that you do this. Now, careful, you might think that, oh yeah, I'm genuine, I'm authentic, but are you coming across that way? The way you walk into a room, the way you present yourself, the way you talk, the amount of eye contact all matter. So if you're saying, no, I'm good. uh, No, you're not. This is one we could all work on. Be more genuine, more authentic with our message, with our delivery, and with that willpower. So, hey, I appreciate you being here today. Tell your family, friends, and enemies as we talked about before. If you want the free book, the latest edition of Maximum Influence, go to MaximizeYourInfluence.com, get the free book, just pick up a little shipping and handling, that will come to you. But do comment, hit like, hit subscribe, register on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, under Maximize Your Influence, also on iHeartRadio, because these skills make a difference. These are the skills we should have learned in school, and we know there's a direct correlation between your ability to influence with your success, your income, your relationships, these are key skills. So take one thing about authenticity to today, apply it, master it, use it. And as you know, with that skill, you'll be able to go out and persuade with power.